Thou wast transfigured on the mount, O Christ our God, revealing thy glory to thy disciples as far as they could bear it. Let thine everlasting light shine upon us sinners through the prayers of the Theotokos, O giver of light, glory to Thee. Hi there. My name is Father Athanasios Heros, and I'm the dean here at St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida, and I'm your host for Be Transfigured Ministries. Guess what? It's time again for a new Bible study. Now, I know, I know you've been waiting for two years, but finally we're producing a new series of Bible studies. This Bible study is on St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Again, like our Bible study on Acts, inspired by the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. There is one unfortunate detail which you are finally figuring out by watching this video tonight, that we are not live streaming currently because of the inadequate industry, internet streaming capabilities here at the cathedral. We're working on that, and as soon as that figures out, we'll be able to live stream our Bible study. In the meantime, every week we will post a new video for our past series, and you'll be able to find that on our website at www.liveanewlifeinchrist.org. So, here we are. We are here to study a wonderful book. And tonight, what I want to do is I want to feature tonight is going to be a little bit about how, how to study the Bible as an Orthodox Christian, kind of get us kind of grounded in how we're going to, to move forward. And then we're also going to talk about a little bit of over... Uh, um, overview of the book of Romans and how we're going to proceed with St. John Chrysostom. Let us first talk about what we have in front of us. Okay, so I mentioned that our homilies were based on St. John Chrysostom's homilies on the book of Romans. And the book we're using is a brand new translation from Father Panayotis Papayoriu. Many of you will know him. He used to be the priest at St. George in Newport Ritchie. So for those of you who have been here for a long time, you remember Father Paniotti. He's now in Marietta, Georgia, but he has produced a wonderful new translation. Unfortunately, it was so popular, it's already out of print. <laughs> and Holy Cross Press has not yet produced a new copy. In the meantime, we'll be handing out copies for everybody. You all have copies of that with you, correct? Yeah. Okay. The second thing we have is each week I'm going to produce for you a study guide. It's my little gift to you. So you can enjoy Bible study each week without panicking about writing copious and copious and copious notes. You can still do that if you wish, but at least this gives you an outline of everything we're going to cover tonight including, because not everyone will have a copy of the homilies, when we actually begin getting to the excerpts of the homilies, I've actually printed them in the, in the study guide. So that will be of benefit to all of you. Um, the other thing I want to start with is what Bible to use. We know, of course, the New Testament was written in what language? Greek. You don't have to be. You don't have to be embarrassed to say it. Greek. However, it is difficult in 21st century America to study in the original Kine Greek, and so we are going to be having our Bible study using the Orthodox Study Bible. For those of you watching at home, it looks like this: the Orthodox Study Bible, which is the New King James translation of the New Testament. It is the only edition of the scriptures in America as a study Bible produced by completely by Orthodox scholars. There's another translation of the scriptures, but it does not have the notes and articles that this wonderful Bible has. So it's a very great resource. 
So one of the things, as you see in your study guide, one of the things is that you have to buy a good quality Bible. One of the things that I think is important for us to consider when looking at a Bible, because when we're talking about translation, we have to be weary about who is publishing the Bible. And so if you look at your study guide, you'll notice I picked up from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, the original Greek says, Now, I have four different ways, six different ways, I'm sorry, that the English translation of that, ex that same expression holds true. The New King James, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. New International Version, so then, brothers, stand firm and hold the, te the teachings. Uh, I don't remember what BBE stands for. So then, brothers, be strong in purpose and keep the teaching. And the new linear translation, with all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on everything we taught you. The, another translation says, so then, our friends, stand firm and hold on to those truths. And finally, the last version says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions and instructions. The reason I mention this is we can no longer rest on the staying, at least they're learning the Bible. Because even the translation that we're reading is affected by who's publishing the Bible. And so when you're reading a Bible that is published by Protestants who don't like traditions, they take the word paradosis, which is very clearly traditions, and they change it to teachings, sometimes affirmations, and even once says, this says truths. Paradosis has nothing to do with the word truth and also the word instruction. So you see all of these things have been woven into these translations because there's always a motive by the person who's translating the scriptures. And so that's why even though every translation has its own limitations, I always refer to the Orthodox Study Bible because this is going to be faithful to our teachings and our understandings of the church. However, all translations are sometimes a little quirky. In fact, I was working today on one of the future sessions and a word came up and the Orthodox Study Bible had one translation for it and the Revised Standard Version had another translation for it. I'm like, well, that's interesting. So what I choose to do when I do my Bible studies is I have two other resources in front of me. This one is the bilingual. It has the original Greek on one side, the original Greek on one side, the Kine Greek on one side, and the Revised Standard Version English on the other side. And so I can go back and forth. I can say, well, here's what the original Greek said, and here's what the Revised Standard Version says. Now, the Revised Standard Version on the study that I was looking at earlier today is not the same as the New King James. So sometimes I find myself, well, now why would this translator have chosen this word and this translator have chosen another word? For that, I go to this Bible. And this Bible is Greek and Greek. It has the original Greek on one side and modern Greek on the other side. It's just, this one just happens to be the New Testament. The reason this is beneficial is because I believe that Greek scholars know best what Greek means. And <laughs> I know, it, it sounds funny, right? <laughs> so I have found many times that when I look at the nuances of what the Greek scholars have chosen as the Greek word, it helps me better understand the nuances of the original Greek.
because we have to admit that when translating something into English, you're, there's always going to be the potential for losing something. However, we have to be practical, right? We're in America. It's 2018. English is our language. Um, and so this is, but this Bible is, always comes in handy because it helps me see what Greek, what Greeks say the Greek meant. And sometimes you'll see some nuances there, which is really cool. Okay, so where can we get the Bibles? Of course, our bookstore here sells them. For those of us who live locally at the St. Nicholas Cathedral Bookstore, sells the Orthodox Study Bibles. It also sells a couple of other editions of the New Testament. However, it is the 21st century. You can get the Orthodox Study Bible on Kindle if you wanted something for your tablet. You can also get the... Um, there's, a, there's two free apps on the computer. BibleGateway.com is a good one. And one thing that I have on my phone is ebible.com. And both of those, you can actually change translations and you can compare, oh, what does this translation say versus what does that translation say? And both those resources are free on the internet. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, you can do that or you can purchase a Bible. Um, on the on um, at the bookstore. So, having said now the types of Bibles to have, let's move on in your study guide to point number three. Actually, let's go back for just a quick moment. I want to see. I want to mention something. Saint John Chrysostom said, since we're inspired by Saint John Chrysostom tonight. He was speaking on, in, in a sermon on the Old Testament, and he was, he was explaining why it's difficult for us, now that was him, you know, 1,700 years ago, why it's difficult to understand the Old Testament. And you see here it's in point number two on your study guide. He says, on the obscurity of the Old Testament, he spoke about the difference in inheritance translations because the Greek is a translation of the Hebrew. So even the Old Testament that we read in Greek is a translation of the original Hebrew. So we have to be aware that there's always some things. So sometimes you're going to find in our Bible studies week to week, we're going to pick a word and we're going to look at it and say, hmm, what's really, what is St. Paul really saying there? Or what is St. John Chrysostom really saying there? And we're going to look at some nuances of language, which is really important. Okay, so that, that's about the Bible. Let's talk about reading. There are a couple things about reading scriptures. The way I describe it is there's reading for content and there's reading for context. What I mean by that is when we are just wanting to get the whole picture... We're not reading for deep, we're not reading for deep meaning, we're just reading to see what is the storyline, the context of what is being said, because one verse leads to another, leads to another, and so every time you stop, something is either about to happen or has happened, so one very important part of reading for Bible study is reading for context. And for our Bible study, I'm going to suggest find the time to read the entire book of Romans every week. It's not that long. You might have to break it up in one or two sessions. But if you get in the habit of reading the book of Romans every single week from front to finish, you're going to start seeing the thread. You're going to start seeing the themes. You're going to start seeing the bigger picture that St. Paul is trying to accomplish in his letter to the Romans. Because as we'll see next week when we get into the very beginning of the letter, he begins setting all these things in motion that he's going to later talk about uh, in his letters. And so the more you read from start to finish without studying, without taking notes, without asking questions, just to absorb the context of the story. And then dig down every now and then and say, these are the passages we're reading now. And they begin to come out in a completely different way. Because we're finally saying, well, where does that fit into the whole story? Oh, that's where St. Paul is going there. 
he's leading us to this point in a couple of chapters. Or now we're going to say, oh, that's why he said in chapter 1, this, this, and the other thing. When you start to see those two things together, you really begin to, to, to understand the scriptures in a, in a very different way. Uh, I know it's daunting to say read it once a week. But I think once you, get, once you get into it, after a few weeks, you'll start to see the rhythm. It actually goes faster, depending on how, on how quickly you read. All right, so as a reminder, when you ask a question, just press your microphone so, the, so it picks up on the video because we want the people watching at home. Turn it on. It takes about two seconds for the, for the microphone to, to cue over. That way people watching the video can benefit also from your question. I find when I read the Bible and I keep reading the same thing over and over, I find something I missed the time before. Exactly, yes. So that's the other benefit of reading it every week is that different pieces are going to jump out at you. Absolutely. Well, basically, I stick with the New Testament. And when I'm done with the New Testament and I go back to Matthew... Oh, I didn't pick, pick that up the last Right. Time. And, and there's some reason for that. Part of it is we can't pick everything up every time. The other thing is, 10 weeks from now, after week after week after week of Bible study, we're not going to be the same people we were 10 weeks earlier. And so when you go back to chapter 1, having studied it, having lived 10 weeks of life there'll be more that comes out at you that way as well. So the two things happen. We can't possibly see it all at once. And then as we grow and as we develop, as we mature in our understanding of the scriptures, more of it begins to, to kind of come to life for us. Make sense? Okay. The other thing is then when you're studying, I don't know, some people are different for this. Some people love to fill the margins with notes. Some people like to use a highlighter. Um, some people use a journal. The benefit of like the, uh, the Kindle version, the Kindle version or the Nook version allows you to highlight but hide your highlights. Because for the same reason, if you make a note in the margin today and then a year from now your life has changed, it may not mean the same thing to a year from now that it meant a year earlier. And so maybe the note doesn't make, doesn't make as much impact for you. So what I like to do, and I don't have the other Bible with me, but I keep two Bibles. I keep one for context reading that has no notes in it. And then I have another Bible that I've got all sorts of scribbles in circles and lines and arrows and this and that's the one that when I'm really digging into something I'll write little notes oh think of this or oh what about this but I don't want to be distracted by those thoughts when I'm reading for context so I'm blessed that I have more than one copy of the Bible so what I'll tend to do is I'll use one for all those notes and one that I keep clean that has just the text of the Bible so I'm not distracting myself oh and as a matter of fact this just happened to me uh, a couple of months ago I was reading through and I looked at a note that I had made to myself 20 years ago and I'm, I'm not exaggerating myself, but boy, have I learned a lot since then. Because I, I thought I was making some really profound comment, you know, <laughs> in the margin. <laughs> and now 20 years from now, I'll think, boy, did I think I knew something back then, right? That's the other part of life. So, um, uh, to me, that's, that's the benefit of, you know, those different types. But it's all part of Bible study. The scriptures are something that the, the church fathers and Chrysostom was very big on this. They want the, the scripture to be part of us, to be able to just proceed from us and just that every time we open our mouths, the words of scriptures are coming out. When you see, for example, when you get into the homilies of Chrysostom, our editors have told us he's quoting Hebrews here, or he's quoting Romans here, or he's quoting um, he, uh, Corinthians. But Chrysostom didn't bother to say, as St. Paul said in Corinthians 2, verses 25, he just began quoting the scriptures. In fact, here's a pop quiz. 
What do you think is the earliest date that any Christian was able to quote chapter and verse in the Bible? Take a guess. Anyone want to guess? Do you want to guess? No. Come on, Karen, at least guess. You're afraid to open your mouth. In the 1500s. Want to know why? Until Gutenberg's Bible, there were no chapter and verses. So when our Protestant brothers and sisters get so wrapped up into the numbers and all that, John 3, 16, or Luke 12, for the first 1,500 years of Christianity, there were no chapters and numbers. It was just the Gospel of Luke. In this case, the letter to the Romans. And so we kind of get trapped in that a little bit. And that's why I, I love this particular edition of the homilies. Because in other editions, editors have inserted in parentheses chapter verse. Here, Father Paniotti has done all those as end notes. So if you want to know what chapter and verse is, you can flip to the end. Oh, that's 1712 or whatever the case might be. And it doesn't interrupt the, the stream of it all. Because what's really cool is St. John Chrysostom preached these homilies in real time in the church. Chrysostom preached every day in church. Now keep in mind that they were having services every day in the great church. He was the patriarch of Constantinople. And so every day there was services in the cathedral. And so every day he would preach. And so many people suspect that he actually had a scribe. And the scribe would be carefully notating what his, what his sermon was. In fact, uh, this happened several times um, in the study on Acts. The editors have said that the scribe must have gotten something wrong here because the scribe's edition makes no sense whatsoever because he used a few words that just grammatically were nonsense and obviously just a scribal error because there was somebody there actually writing down what he was preaching the the exciting part for me and then we're going to dig in how we're going to proceed every single week the exciting thing for me which is why i call this a bible study based on the homilies of saint john chrysostom they don't call him golden mouth for nothing he was using contemporary comparisons he was the Billy Graham of the Christian world and he has been for centuries Protestants Orthodox Catholics Christians all over the spectrum read his works read his sermons and get inspiration from them how we're gonna benefit if you look down now at the bottom of page one on your study guide Chrysostom, who was um, a priest in Antioch, is when he actually uh, preached these particular sermons. Somewhere between 375 and 385, and I use the term CE here, which is called the Common Era. I know we're used to saying BC and AD, but we're trying to become consistent with people who are, you know, performing, you know, searches and scholars and things. So we're we're using the the scholarly citation of CE and then anything that we call BC is now BCE before the common era and common era that's what that stands for so in preparation we want to read Romans every week I already mentioned what the accomplishment that that's going to give us and then turn the page um, every week is going to be based on the next homily in the series Okay, so tonight I handed out for you what is called the prologue, and it is the reason for studying the book of Romans, and it is some general understanding of the book of Romans. That's where Chrysostom begins in a prologue, and then next week with session two, we'll actually dig in with homily one, and the way the homilies are situated is that they will just continue along chapter and verse. 
Okay, so as we're proceeding, we're going to see the chapter, we're going to see the verses that he's covering, and sometimes he may linger on one or two words for a couple of pages. Sometimes he may rapidly go through a few sentences, but the homilies are where our basis is going to be. So each week will be another homily. And so what I've passed out for you tonight is the prologue, okay? And I've also given you the introductory material to the book. It's a lot of information. And a third thing that I've handed out to you tonight is this article from Father Paniotti, who Chrysostom was, and a little bit about Chrysostom's life. Because if we're going to benefit from Chrysostom, it's best that we get to know him. Um, again, he was in Antioch, which was one of the biggest cities of the known world at the time in terms of the Christian world. And uh, just absolutely wonderful, wonderful information for us. Okay. Uh, I mentioned also other places to get his homilies. You can get them at the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, which is on the internet, the New Advent Fathers, and you can also purchase different translations of his homilies from Christian Book Distributors, which is christianbook.com. You cannot find this edition because it is currently out of print. This is published by Holy Cross Seminary, our seminary in Boston. So as soon as those are reprinted, we'll get a, we'll get a stack of them here in our bookstore. All right, so let's move right on. Book of Romans, author and date. Uh, according to scholarship, St. Paul wrote this while he was in Corinth around 55 to 57 CE. And Chrysostom, let's see what it says here. Chrysostom felt it was relevant to understand why Paul would speak differently on similar subjects. Just as we here in Tarpon Springs do not live the same life as, oh, my listeners in Brisbane, England, in Great Britain, our lives are different, right? Eight and a half years I was in Florence, South Carolina. The Christian life is different. The needs of life are different. In the same way, when St. Paul, he was writing to the Romans or to the Corinthians or to the Philippians, the truth is their lives were different. Their challenges were different. And so we're going to see, and sometimes Chrysostom even references this, that St. Paul talks about the same topics differently to one city as he does to another. And the, the nice thing there is that it gives us an understanding also of our ancestors. How did our brothers and sisters in Rome live? Not just how did the Roman society live, but what was Christian life like in ancient Rome? What was Christian life like in, Cor in Corinth, for example? And so you see St. Paul writing to real Christians. And so what's beautiful is it gives us the full context, yet a different approach to the same questions. And Chrysostom felt that it was important to get that different, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a different perspective. All right, so when we're reading the book of Rome, from the book of Romans, we have to understand the context is first century Rome. He's not going to write to the Romans as if they're Jewish Christians living in Palestine. Right? And so that's going to build into our context as well. You're going to see that the Roman life and how St. Paul approaches things. And, and then the, the other beauty that we're going to see is because Chrysostom wrote around 385 CE in Antioch, to real Christians, we're going to get an extra layer because sometimes Chrysostom will say, and right here today, our problem is, and he actually gives us a beautiful glimpse into Christian life in Antioch at the end of the fourth century. To me, that's beneficial. Not only does it help us understand our, our ancestors, but I hate to say it like this, it comforts me not a whole lot has changed. We're still struggling with the same 
struggles of Christian life. Society, the world versus the spiritual life and things like that. So we're going to get into some of that in the weeks to come. The book of Romans. Okay. In liturgical calendar, it is read from the second day of Pentecost and lasts for five weeks. Okay, so if you imagine Chrysostom who was celebrating services every day in the church, these sermons are actually given every single day, right? So we have 33, 32 sermons given along a series of days, and he's broken these things up. So we're going to take weeks to study this stuff, but they would have come back having just heard Chrysostom the day before or a couple days earlier, right? And so sometimes you're going to think, why is he repeating himself so much? Well, sometimes it might be as simple as there's something brewing in the community and so several days in a row he's going to hammer down a point. And didn't I say last week this? And didn't I say this? This happened in his homilies to, um, in the book of Acts. He was going on and on about applause in the church. He didn't like applause in the church. And at one point, he actually says in the sermon, didn't I just tell you not to applaud? Which means they must have burst out clapping for something. Right? So it gives us that beautiful real life picture. And so sometimes it might seem repetitive, but that's because maybe that particular community at the end of the fourth century in Antioch was struggling with something. And you're going to see those themes come through as well. So you see first century Rome themes. And then on top of that, you're going to see end of the 4th century Antioch themes, and then we're going to put on top of that 21st century American themes, very specifically Tarpon Springs. And so all those different pieces are going to come together. The book is also read many times when a martyr is commemorated. And we know that, uh, as you see, uh, uh, at one of uh, the, you'll see in the, in the prologue that he says, and we hear this every Wednesday. I think it's every Wednesday which he says, and that's because every time a martyr is commemorated, we hear from the Book of Romans. And so the church has built in Romans to not only a season following Pentecost but also to thematic material. So whenever the church commemorates a martyr saint, we hear many times from the book of Romans. So that's, that's another thing that we're going to benefit from. And it's also read on the feast of the nativity of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, of course, we see as the final prophet of the Old Testament. So you see here liturgically how it's used. Okay, let's move on. I don't want to lose track of time. Let's move on to the structure of Romans. You'll see here I'm on page 2 on the study guide, right? So we have the introduction, which is homilies 1 and 2. We have morality and sinfulness, which is Romans 1, chapter 18, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20. And that's homilies 3 through 7. Salvation without the law, homily 7 through 9. Section 4, a new life in Christ, which is Romans 5 through 7. That's homilies 9 through 13. New life in the Holy Spirit, section 5, which is Romans 8, one chapter all by itself. Homilies 13 through 15. We have section 6, God's plan for the reconciliation of the Jews. Chapters 9 through 11, that's homilies 16 through 19. And then you have the Christian life. Chapters 12 through 16, homilies 20 through 32. So 32 homilies plus tonight, altogether 33 sessions. So it will take us the entire year, because we have a few weeks off here and there, to, to get through all of the Book of Romans using Chrysostom's homilies as our guide. Any questions at this point? Okay. 
The final thing that we're going to do is you'll, you'll see that in each sermon, in each homily, Chrysostom will take chapter and verse in a very traditional sense. Okay? And he'll, he'll quote the verse and then he'll teach its meaning. And then he'll give some kind of context for that teaching. And then every now and then, he will take a word from there and he will dig deeper into some kind of moral truth and teaching of the Christian life inspired by sometimes just one word in that particular verse. And then the ending portion of his homilies are always an exhortation in life. How to take what we've learned in scripture and to change our life. I say over and over, and you're going you're gonna to get tired of hearing me every week. It does us no good even if we memorize the scriptures, if it doesn't somehow change our life. So in the homilies where Chrysostom goes on and he'll leap off from a point and then two or three pages of just good moral teaching and Christian life exhortation. And then toward the end, he'll always give some kind of send off, some kind of, okay, now let's do this. Or he always, he, he normally starts with therefore... And then he goes on to one final challenge, one kind of, and um, I kind of call it the send-off, how he kind of sends us off into the next day. So in the, what's called the argument or the prologue, which is what uh, St. John Christum is argument for studying the book of, of Romans. Point number one, here I'm on the bottom of page two, do you see that on the, on the study guide? Point number one, and you'll notice here, I will tell you it's, page one, chapter one. So if you look at your copy that I gave you of the argument, if you go to page one, you'll see that Father Paniotti has labeled the chapter numbers. Every time I give you a citation of the homily, it's, it's um, by the way, it was copied backwards. So it's the, 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 the um, staples in the wrong spot. The prologue is what we're looking at. So you see there, chapter 1, it says, whenever we observe the memorials, you see that it starts right there. And that's where, that's where I mentioned St. Paul is used for the liturgies for the, for the martyrs. On that chapter, Chrysostom says about why he has such great reverence for St. Paul. The trumpet sound of his spiritual voice gives me a pleasure that exalts and delights my soul. Indeed, my heart grows warm with yearning as I recognize his words, which are so dear to me. I seem to imagine that he is personally present, and I feel as if my eyes are fixed on him as he converses with me. Isn't that beautiful? In fact, there is a beautiful icon. I put it on the internet yesterday when I posted the promotion for the Bible study. There's a beautiful traditional icon of St. Paul whispering in the ear of St. John Chrysostom as he's writing his homilies, right? Because Chrysostom really felt that St. Paul was in his presence when he was preaching. How beautiful reverence that he had for what is arguably the greatest missionary of the Christian world, St. Paul, right? We can't forget he was also a great sinner. He was a murderer. He killed many Christians. But you see this great respect that Chrysostom has for St. Paul. Point number two that Chrysostom makes. It's page 5, chapter verse 19. St. Paul teaches for each at the level needed. Meaning that he always teaches to the crowd. Right? And so you'll see this very common in, the, in church history where um, we reference God coming down to be with the people. Right? The condes condescension of God. Listen to what Chrysostom says here. Page 5, chapter 19 on your handout. 
I'm, uh, yes, page 5, chapter 19. Paragraph 19, I'm sorry. Both physicians and teachers make a practice of acting this way. The physician does not treat those who are at the beginning of an illness in the same way as he does those who have come to the point of having their health restored for the future. Nor does the teacher treat young children in the same way as he does students who need more advanced instruction. I think what's important for us to get from that is God condescended to the humanity. He didn't just preach from heaven. He came down to be with us at our level. But he does it in order to lift us up. He came down to our level. He became one of us to heal us. In the same way, the apostles condescended in their teaching to the level of the people. St. Paul condescended to the level of the people. You're really going to see this in Romans, how he sugarcoats some things at the beginning in order to get them to trust him. And then he elevates them little by little by little. My frustration in our contemporary society is that we live in a world that loves the condescension. Come down to my level, talk to my level, but we don't want to ever grow further than that. We want to stay at our level. And so we want the church to come down and speak to us where, we're at, where we are, but we don't want the church to lift us up to a higher point. Okay, What St. Paul was excellent at doing was speaking to the level of the people to gain their trust, to gain their understanding, and just like a teacher with a little child slowly adds more complex math problems. In the same way, our spiritual life, the church brings us to a basic point, like tonight, we're talking about the basics of Bible study. By the time we've gotten through all 32 homilies, we will have dug much further than basics, right? But we have to have a starting point. Unfortunately, in our contemporary society, we love people to come down to our level, but we never want to be lifted up. And in Christ, the condescension must always be matched with the lifting up. And that's what St. Paul was really good about. Point number three. The reasons to study the book of Romans. Romans teaches us that all deserve God. This is page 6, chapter 24 in the prologue. Let us imitate in our turn this great love that Paul manifested to the world. Even if no one man can keep in order and control the entire world, nor whole cities and nations, let each of us train and correct his life, his wife, children, friends, and neighbors. What he's telling us there is, we can't do it all. God can do it all, but we cannot. But let's at least get those in our immediate circle. Let's talk with our friends, our family, our neighbors, our close associates. As you're going to hear in a few weeks, St. John Christum talks about the different types of ministries. How St. Paul was a preacher. He preached the gospel. He spread the gospel. He, in his own words, he only baptized a couple of people. There's different ministries for different people. Let's at least do what we can for those in our, we could say, area of influence. Knowing ultimately that, that all of us deserve God's love. The entire world deserves God. Not just the Greeks, not just the Romans, not just the Russians or whatever, but the entire world. Finally, point number four. Page 7, paragraph 26. Romans will be a blessing to us and bring us peace. So he says, So let us first shake off this attitude and then with all zeal, then to the members of our household, 
In this way, we shall enjoy abundant peace here on earth by controlling in the fear of God those who are related to us. Then shall we also share in the multitude of the blessings of heaven. With all zeal, he says, to the members of our household. Now, who is our household? It's our immediate family. In our case, it's our church family. This is our household. And so sometimes in our contemporary Christian world, we get wrapped up in this whole mission to save the world. But that isn't necessarily everyone's job. What Chrysostom is saying here, and what we can gather from Romans, what we can benefit from Romans, is that there's enough blessing there that if we can change our life, and through our ministry, those few around us, then if everyone can do that, ultimately the whole world does get saved. Right? But the beauty that 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 St. Paul and through the homily St. John Christum gives us that, that beauty of just, you know what, let's focus on what we've got. Let's start at some point. Let's start small. Now, there's not 100 people here tonight, right? But maybe by the grace of God, by the next 32 weeks, more will show up. And little by little, we're going to all grow together as a family, as a household, because that's our responsibility. That's our job. Our job is not to save the world, St. Silouan said, acquire inner peace and a thousand around you will be saved. Right? It doesn't mean focus only on yourself. It doesn't mean ignore the world. But it means spend your attention on improving your life for Christ and others will benefit from that blessing as well. And then he says, and then we shall also share in the multitude of the blessings of heaven. Right? Sometimes we get wrapped up, <clears throat> especially uh, those of us who are a little bit more fanatic than others. We get wrapped up in that person should be doing this and that person should be doing this and that person should be doing this and we never give any attention to where we should be changing and where we should be growing and how we should be repenting, right? Let's focus on our own repentance, our own growth, and those in our immediate sphere of influence, our immediate family members, what have you, and then great things can happen. And that's what we can gather uh, from the book of Romans. So that's how we're going to proceed, right? So we're going to start next week with homily one, which takes off with the very introductory verses of chapter one. It's only, we're only going to cover seven verses next week. However, it's pages on just seven verses. And so it's really some beautiful stuff. And again, St. John Chrysostom each week follows this pattern. He does a little chapter verse stuff. He talks about the moral teachings, and then he gives us a good little send-off. Okay? For those of you watching at home, again, we are apologize for not being able to live stream for you at this point, but by the grace of God, someday soon we will be able to live stream our Bible study. In the meantime, visit us on our website at www.liveanewlifeinchrist.org for study guides, for videos of past sessions. And until we see each other again, don't forget to live a new life in Christ. God bless you. Be Transfigured is a production of Be Transfigured Ministries in cooperation with the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida. We depend upon your generosity to maintain our ministry. You can make a safe online donation when you visit our website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org.